Hello. The moment you've been waiting, what, 10 minutes for, at least? <laughs> um, okay. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome. So the talk is Intro to Hacking with Raspberry Pi. But first, I um, kind of want to start off just to get a feel. Um, who's heard of the Raspberry Pi before? I think practically everybody. Good. Okay. Um, who owns at least one? Uh, like pretty much everybody. All right. That's cool. Um, how many of you have it and it's sitting in a closet or a junk drawer or um, something like that? Yeah, most everybody. Cool. Um, I have found that this seems to be like mo where most people's Raspberry Pis are hiding. Um, and how many of you are daunted at the idea of like tinkering with hardware or electronics? A few hands. I think you're all like really shy. Um, so as a software developer, I found a lot of people are kind of scared of the hardware and the electricity and stuff like that. And um, just through my learning through electronics and stuff like that, I just found it really interesting and not nearly as scary as I think a lot of people are. So, um, you know, hopefully this this talk will be for you. Um, but so I was going to say, if you already understand a bunch about circuitry and or are familiar with breadboarding and wiring different things. Um, and you already know how to program the GPIO pins on the Pi, then this is probably not to talk for you. Um, that's most of what I'm going to go over. So if you know like most of this, but maybe have a few holes, you know, might be worthwhile. But um, anyway, and if you feel like sneaking out, I won't be offended. <laughs> um, okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Sarah Withy. I'm a software engineer at Arcadia, which is a company here in town that does data analytics on healthcare records. Um, I'm what I like to call a friendly polyglot software engineer, so I dabble in different programming languages and technologies, things like that. Um, I'm also a hardware tinkerer, so back when I was in college I was on a robotics team and went in not knowing the foggiest thing about, I knew how to wire an LED and that was about it, um, and kind of left having built whole chunks of robots, it was kind of really cool. Um, it just kind of felt really fun. Um, and then uh, you can find me at Geeky Girl Sarah. And in case you're curious, um, yeah, that is uh, Simone Yetz, I believe is her last name, the shitty robot builder, if you've seen her on YouTube. Um, I got to, um, coincidentally, I was in San Francisco at the same time she was holding a workshop, and it was called uh, Build and Beer. So they gave everybody <laughs> a bunch of beer and was like, let's build terrible robots together. And so we had a bunch of competitions and. Um, my team built this terrible little turtle here, and we called it Bruce. And Bruce is made from popsicle sticks and servos, and um, <laughs> a beer can on top, and that's a grape for his face. So, um, and he walked really lopsided. It was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so a little bit about what I'm going to chat with today. I'm going to talk a different a little bit about different Raspberry Pis, and um, they, they keep growing and multiplying, it seems. I've given this talk multiple times, and every time I find there's a new one they've come out with, so I have to keep changing my presentation to update for that. Um, we'll go on a little bit about the hardware, and like I like to say, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I like to take the electrical engineering out of the electrical engineering. Um, and then we'll go into the guts of what I really love, which is the programming part, and kind of show just really how easy it is to mess with this. Um, I have a few sample projects I'll go over and then kind of hopefully go into some ways that maybe inspire you to kind of tinker on your own and build things. So, um, sound good? Silent nods. All right. Um, so first, um, the Raspberry Pi. So it's a credit card sized computer that plugs into your TV and keyboard, which you may have already known. But um, it's the founders of it also said it's a capable little computer which can be used to used in electronics projects and for many of the things that your desktop PC does like spreadsheets, word processing, and games. It also plays high definition video and we want to see it being used by kids all over the world to learn programming, which is kind of the original point of it. So it's just a really cheap $35 computer that can teach kids to code rather than like a $700 you know, giant monster that they would have to get. Um, so cheaper for like schools and stuff too. Um, but of course nerds kind of jumped on this like, dude, cheap computers, awesome. And you know, kind of took over. Uh, and then I wanted to define the term hacking in the way I'm going to use it, which is um, from hackaday.com. They said, we're taking back the term hacking, which has been soured in the public mind. Hacking is an art form that uses something in a way which was not originally intended. This highly creative activity can be highly technical, simply clever, or both. 
Hackers bask in the glory of building it instead of buying it, repairing it rather than trashing it, and raiding it, raiding their junk bins for new projects every time they can steal a few moments away. So are any of you like little tinkerers and hackers like they define? A couple of you. All right. I like to think I am, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm not. Um, all of my slides, wiring, diagrams, pictures, everything are all online. So um, sarahwithy.com slash raspberry pi, you can get everything later. Um, and you're more than welcome to tweet these or take pictures, whatever you want to do. Um, and yes, very code, much resource, um, how to pi, total wow. Okay, so we can start off by talking a little bit about the Raspberry Pis, kind of some of their technical capabilities and such like that, and the differences between all of them, because there's so many now. So in 2006 was when they had this first idea of making a small little affordable computer for kids. And then in 2008 is kind of when the processors became sort of feasible enough to actually pull off this project. Um, and then 2011 is when they made the first basic ones. So the first alpha boards kind of went out. So it's kind of not a new product by any means. Um, but I know it was about 2015 when I gave this talk the first time. And that's when I started to see the name really became more of a household term that a lot of people had. Um, so then they sold a lot of the first ones in 2012. They came out with new models and more new models and more new models and more new models. Um, so that's kind of the basic timeline of this. Um, uh, these are kind of the six basic ones here. So the A plus and the B plus were the original two. Um, the A plus being the lower end model and the B plus being the higher end model at the time. Um, then they came out with the two, which is kind of the same idea as the B, but they just upgraded components. And then the Pi 3 kind of upgraded even more components. Um, and then they came out with the Pi 0, which is an even smaller, just simpler board. So it's even, it's like half the size of the other ones. And I'll show these off here in a minute. Um, and then the 0W is the one where they added Wi-Fi on top of the 0. So um, I'm kind of always constantly impressed that they keep like adding more and more cool stuff to this tiny little board. Um, so this is kind of a basic comparison. I'm not going to dive into them too much, but you'll see kind of as they get newer and newer, um, the processors kind of get beefier and the um, CPUs and the memory's always stayed about one gigabyte. So it's not like super high tech or fancy, um, but what do you expect for 35 bucks? Um, but I was impressed that the B plus, which they came out with like several months ago, now has um, gigabit ethernet into it, AC, wireless, Bluetooth 4.2. Um, they keep cramming more and more stuff onto this chip, which I think is really awesome. Um, and then the Zero W that now comes with um, wireless in, so it's even still pretty fast. And it's only 10 bucks, so if you find you have a little need for it, um, there's that. So um, I have one of the original ones. So this was like the B, I think. And this one's one of the newer ones. It's the three plus. And you'll kind of see like they're both about the same. But uh, and I'm not gonna pass this one around, but this is the W. Let's see if I can get the camera on there. Yeah. Um this is um so it's the W, it's kinda smaller, it's about half the size of the big pie and I have another board attached to it because I was using it for a different project. Um, but yeah, that's a pie. And I had it <laughs> um, attached to a battery so I could stick it in this cute little pouch and then carry it with me. Um, and I can kind of show that off like after if you kind of want to see it up close. But um, so yeah, those are getting passed around. So it's kind of the basics of the pie. Yeah. So there's, you know, if you decide you want a particular project, um, it may not need wireless or something, you could probably get one of the older ones, but at this point you might as well just buy the newer ones unless you need the portability of the zero. Um, anyway, all right, enough with the boring stuff. Um, let's dive into the hardware. So wires and circuits and breadboards, oh my. Okay, so some people may have learned this in like um, different like science classes in high school or something, but just a review. Uh, so a circuit is basically just a complete route that electricity can travel. Pretty simple. 
Um, this is a series circuit. So basically, it just goes in one little loop. It's just one series, if you will. Um, currently, it's broken because this little switch is open. But when we flip the switch on, it will close the circuit, and then electricity can travel through. So that's kind of a schematic symbol for a battery. That's a schematic symbol for a light bulb. And so um, with the switch open, it does this. A parallel circuit basically means there's more than one circuit to it. So the electricity could flow in more than one direction. So if we have a switch here that will close all of the circuits, so if we shut that, then both light bulbs would come on. So electricity can actually split apart, go to both, and then join back together. Um, you could do like a light switch here and here, and then you could control them separately, which is kind of how your house works. Um, yeah, so you can kind of configure that how you want. And this ultimately is kind of how the Pi works. So we're going to find out in a little bit that there's a whole bunch of different inputs and outputs on the board, and we can kind of control those with different switches, if you will, programmatically. Um, breadboards are these little things right here. Um, and I can kind of pass this around a bit. But they're basically like little um, prototyping things. So like instead of soldering wires all together, you can just um, kind of plug them into the holes and just kind of fiddle around until you decide like how you want your circuit to be. And then that's when you would, in theory, if you were like a professional electronics person, take them to get produced. Um, so the term came from literally a breadboard um, that somebody had taken this board that they normally cut bread on and just like drilled screws in and made these wirings um, and sort of just adopted the name from there. But modern breadboards kind of look more like this. So the idea is there's a little gap in the middle and you can take circuit chips and plug them in so the pins go kind of on both sides of the gap. And then you can just plug wires in, and they're basically connected to those pins. So like these three black wires here are still connected to the chip through the board. Um, so usually there's different features to them. There's power rails, which are kind of the red and blue things on the side. Um, there's a dip support. So dip is the basically the integrated circuit chip that usually goes in the middle, like this one here. Um, and then terminal strips are the little holes that come out from that. And I'll explain those next. Um, so as you see that, and it goes around, the side ones are connected together. So the blue ones are all connected together. The red ones are all connected together. And then the five in the middle are connected in strips like that. Um, so you can connect basically up to five things together in the middle, and then all these will connect it together on the side. And that's usually so you can provide um, a positive and a negative power to this. And then it makes it really easy to kind of just wire everything up together. Um, and this will make a little bit more sense with my explanation. Um, so how circuits work on breadboards is generally we have red that we signify as positive and then blue or black, which will be negative. Um, so if we get the idea of like a battery, the positive end of the battery will come in if it comes up to the red side, which is the power, then we can like wire it over to the terminal rail, go through an LED. Um, with LEDs, we'll need resistors, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then that can go over to the negative side and then come back to the battery. So you can see that there's kind of a full circle loop there. Um, with the Raspberry Pi, we can kind of do the same thing. So basically, we're going to have a power pin and a negative pin that's on the Pi itself. We can wire those to the edge, and then any components we can power straight off of those. And then we'll also find out we can control some of these programmatically, and then we can wire those up too. So are we making sense so far? Yep, okay. It's pretty basic. Um, and then the Raspberry Pi uses 3.3 volts, which is not like super important to know, um, especially when you're not messing with the electrical engineering side of things. But um, this may come in handy if you start messing with like Arduinos as well, which are 5 volts, so you have to kind of know the difference between um, some of the components you buy to work with these. So that's the main thing. Um, yeah, and Arduinos use 5 volts. So if you wire something with an Arduino, it will not be compatible with this. You have to change a few things. So that's the big takeaway. Um, all right, moving on. So GPIO pins, I kind of mentioned them earlier. They're general purpose input and output. So basically, 
if you imagine somebody with light switches, they can control on and off with these GPI opens. Um, and they're basically how we're going to talk to all the components on our breadboard. Um, so Raspberry Pi, except for like the very, very, very first model, which only had 26 pins, all of them have 40. You can pretty much just, I took out that whole part. It's not even really useful anymore. There's two power pins. So remember when I said there's 3.3 volts that we'll be using? There's two of those. Um, there's two 5 volts. So we're going to kind of not mess with those for now. Um, there's eight ground. So any of those, like if you're wiring up things, you can return it back to any of the grounds. Um, there's 20 controllable ones, so those are the ones we can programmatically talk to. And then there's two miscellaneous ones, which has special purposes, and that's kind of outside the purpose of our talk. Um, unfortunately, these aren't labeled. Um, and it's kind of a bummer because they label so much other stuff on here, but they don't label the 40 pins. Um, however, I've solved that problem for you by <laughs> providing this handy little chart. Um, so if you hold it up like this, um, the top corner is the top up here. So it's like the closest to the edge. Um, so that one's 3.3 volt, GPIO, 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 ground, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, I also have this diagram on the website. I printed it out and usually like keep it, like sometimes I actually attach it to my pie when I'm wiring things just for handy sake. Um, I also found out if you shrink it down, I actually like punch it over the pins. So like the pins are literally coming out of the holes. It's kind of a fun little thing I've done. Um, makes it a little bit easier. So are we still on board so far? This is kind of the part where I'm just like throwing a whole bunch of stuff at you really quickly and then hoping um, it'll make sense in a few more minutes when we get into our projects. But, um, all right. Um, are you all mostly software people? Mostly, yeah. Okay, so this will probably be the part you're more interested in. The part why you're really here. Um, oh, thanks. Um, okay, so generally I'm going to use Python for this. Um, when you get the Raspberry Pi and you download the operating system, it's kind of built in already. So uh, that's partly why I'm using it. But they have other libraries and other languages. You can do this in... I think Java and Ruby, and I think I saw a PHP one the other day. Um, different things like that. So you can kind of adapt as you need to. Um, but there's a different pin modes. And these are um, kind of confusing at first. So I'm going to try and stay consistent with it. But the board mode is the physical pin number. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, BCM is the GPIO pin number. So this is GPIO 2, 3, 4, 17, 27, 22. And yeah, they're not in order. Um, and that's just kind of how it was ended up being designed. So generally, I find the board mode a little easier just because you can count them a little faster. But um, if you prefer like using the literal number, you can do that too. OK. So when you're first writing your program, you have to import the GPIO libraries. So those are already built in. You don't have to download them. They're already on your Pi. Um, and then pick one of those two modes. So GPIO.setMode, whichever one you want. Um, and then for each pin that you want to use, you have to tell it what you're going to do with it. So if it's going to be an input where you're going to get in a signal through that pin, you have to tell it pin number 4, comma, GPIO in, or if you're going to send a signal out, you tell GPIO out. Um, so that's where the number comes in. If it's board mode, that's pin 3 and 4. If it's G BCM mode, it's GPIO 3 or GPIO 4. Um, and all these you can change later, so you can actually change inputs and outputs, and one of our projects will do that too. So if we're going to write out to these pins, um, so if you imagine like a light switch, um, the easiest way is usually true and false. So true will turn on the output and false will turn off the output. You can also say high and low. So that's high voltage, which would be 3.3 volts, and low voltage, which would be zero volts. Um, so that's basically um, pretty easy. Makes sense, right? Remember your binary counting days? You don't really need binary for this, but um, yeah, pretty simple. <laughs> um, for the input, so it's kind of... Also pretty simple, you just say, I'm going to get an input from whatever pin, 
and you store that value. So X would have whatever is being sent into pin number four. So, um, you know, if I had like some sort of sensor, I could set it to something based on the input from some pin. Um, and you can either read them as true and false or one and zero. Um, Raspberry Pis do not have any analog pins. So they can't have any variability. It's just on or off. Um, and then finally, when your program's done, once it's done messing with all the hardware stuff, you really should run a cleanup command. So this basically cancels out all the inputs and outputs and just returns it to a sort of normal mode, if you will. Um, and that's just to make sure you don't have like stray electricity running places when your program's not trying to do anything. So um, that's basically it. Um, pick your mode, import your libraries, pick your mode, um, do your setup on your pins, do whatever you want, and then clean it up when you're done. So that's the basic process. Um, oh, yep, recap. Um, so you can input or output from those two. All right, have I flooded you with too much information yet? No. I mean, it seems kind of reasonable now, right? Like, not, are we, we're not daunted yet, are we? Okay. Man, you're all quiet, crap. Okay, so the first one, um, we're going to mess with some LEDs, which um, I call the hello world of electronics, if you will. Um, who knows what one of these two things are? Anybody know what the left thing is? Silent? Yep. Yeah. And the right thing? Night Rider? Yeah. Um, so they both kind of have the same principle of like the swooping lights on the front of them. Um, I'm glad that at least everybody knows these. So our first project is we're going to take about eight LEDs and we're just going to make them kind of go back and forth. Um, we can go either Battlestar Galactica Cylon or the Knight Rider kit car. Um, you could also, you know, take your kid's favorite like teddy bear and like put in LEDs and scare your kid. and It'll be great fun. Um, you know, different things like that. Could be, possibly be a cat toy too or something. Um, so we will need a Raspberry Pi and a power supply, um, one breadboard. They also make smaller ones too. So if you wanted to use a smaller one, it's about like half the size you can do that. Um, we're gonna need eight LEDs, eight resistors, which I'll talk about in a second, and then nine little wires. And I'll get to those too. Um, so jumper wires, these. Um, so they're just little pre-cut wires for prototyping. Um, there's a few. I've, I've got like an entire bin full of these. Um, and there's different ones, but they just kind of just easily like plug in there, plug in somewhere else, and then you can kind of just wire things up really easily. Um, I like them because they don't have to mess with like cutting wires and soldering little ends on them. So, um, and I have some male to male, male to female, and female to female wires, and I keep them in a little craft tub because it's kind of easy to keep them all separated. But um, so they're just called jumper wires because they just kind of jump from one point to another. Um, and LEDs, I'm sure you've all heard of. They're light emitting diodes, so they're kind of like a light bulb, but not. But they are kind of. Um, and so the basics of this is a diode just ensures electricity goes one direction. So most of the time, if you have a wire, it could go either direction. A diode just kind of stops it from going in the wrong direction, if you will. Um, so if you wired up an LED backward and it doesn't work, there's a good chance you just wired it wrong. So just like flip it around. Um, when you buy them, they come with one side that's longer than the other one. So that's to help you know which side is the one you plug into and which one um, returns the electricity back. So the anode is the longer one, and that's your positive one, and the cathode is the shorter one, which is the negative one. So you always come in through the longer one and go out the shorter one. Um, and then I mentioned that you always need a resistor. So the basic idea is it resists the flow of electricity. So it just slows down the process. And the reason is if if you feel bored, you can wire one up without a resistor and see what it does. It basically glows really bright and then fries. So you basically kill a resistor. That's kind of fun to or kill an LED. It's fun to do like once, but if you keep doing it, you're just wasting money. So, um, but if you put it in your series with the LED, it just slows it so it glows rather than like more or less explodes. And then they explode out, it just explodes inside. That's fun. Um, resistors are easy because they can flow either direction, so you don't have to worry about a direction to these. Um, the band colors will tell you the resistance value, which is in ohms. 
Um, we're not going to cover that. Um, I suggest just buying them in kits where if you buy the LEDs, the right resistors come with them. Um, that's a little easier. Um, and without those, uh, they just glow, like I said, bright white, and then the element inside explodes. Um, okay, wiring, which is kind of fun. Um, so what we want to do first is take the Pi and find the ground. So there's eight of them, as I said. You can just pick any one of them and drop it to one of your ground rails on the side. Um, and then take eight LEDs and plug them in across the gap. Um, and then the next step would be to connect the resistors to all the LEDs. So usually that's, I think it's easiest to just go from the shorter wire to the ground. Um, but you can connect it on either side. And then connect the longer ones, the anodes, up to different GPIO pins. So keep track of those because those are how you're going to actually talk to these. Um, so what we're going to do is as we turn on and off all these GPIO switches, they kind of act like light switches. So they're going to just turn on these and turn them off again. Um, so yeah, so basically we're programmatically flipping switches on all the blue wires. Um, and then I think I have arrows. Yeah. So remember that parallel circuit? So we're just basically building like eight little parallel circuits together. Okay. So now the code, the fun part, right? <laughs> um, so we're going to import that GPI library and then import a time library because if we don't do that, they're just all going to like glow really fast and we can't see. Um, I think it's easy to create an array of those pin numbers. So um, 357, 29, 31 is kind of where I plug them in in my demo. Um, and then if we do 0.2 seconds in between each blink, I seem to think that's about a Cylon speed, if you will. So, um, so that's going to be a variable. So we need to set that up first. So we need to set it up in board mode. So that's where the physical pin numbers on the side. And for all of those pins, we're going to set them up as output pins. So I thought I had a loop in there. No? OK. Um, yeah, so that's basically what we're going to do. I think I took it out of the loop. Um, yeah, she just need to loop through all those array pins and turn them on. Um, and then basically for each of those pins in that array, we're going to go through a loop. We're going to turn it on with the true, um, wait that 0.2 seconds, and then turn it back off again. So flip on the first one, wait, flip off the first one, turn on the second one, wait, turn off the second one, and so on. So that would be the forward motion. We can do the same thing with the loop in reverse, so just going negative one steps backward. Kind of do the same for each of those. Um, and then I included a negative one here. So um, if you don't do that, you're going to end up like twice as long on both sides. So it just looks like it actually blows back and forth. Otherwise, it's just twice as long. And it blinks twice on the side. So um, really simple. Uh, you know, kind of, um, oh yeah, that's the part. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like in the end. Um, looks Cylon-esque, right? Yeah. I'm going to kind of look in. And you can see all the resistors along at the top and the different wires. Um, they kind of plug in along the rails here. So whoop, let's go back. So does this seem easy enough? Um, that's the pie over there, and this is just one breadboard. I think I had extra chips on there for some reason, but yeah, yep, you're fine. Uh, all right, so does this seem like something you could like run home and do go do? Yeah, all right. Um, um, are you all still awake? Do you need to like get up and stretch real quick? So sensors are also really fun. Um, so you can teach computers to see or hear or do all sorts of other little things. And this is kind of where like sort of the power of the tinkering comes in, I think, is letting it be able to interact with the world. So um, this is called an ultrasonic distance sensor. Like this little doodad. I think it kind of looks like E.T. or like a little robot or something. Um, so it measures distance with timed sound waves. 
Um, so ultrasonic basically means like above your hearing range. So it sends out a sound that you can't hear. It bounces against something and returns, and the length of that time tells you how far away something is. Um, and these particular ones are about 40 kilohertz, so your dog might be able to hear them, but you probably won't. Um, and then the time tells the difference. There's four little pins on it. Um, one is called VCC, which is your power. One's a trigger, so when we send it a signal, it will give out the sound. One's the echo, so it listens for the sound that comes back. And then one's our ground, so those two are always on, and then we just kind of control the other two. Um, this particular sensor works on 5 volts. Remember when I said the whole 3.3 .3 and 5 volt thing? Don't get mixed up. So, um, Since your Raspberry Pi mostly works on 3.3 .3 volts, we have to kind of make sure if we're sending out 5 volts, we don't bring in 5 volts to the GPIO because bad things happen. So we're going to work with that. But the basic simple solution is if we use a 1K resistor on it, it will kind of regulate the power for us. And that's one of those like electrical engineering things that I don't really pay attention to. I just looked up the value online. <laughs> um, okay, so really simple for this one. Um, we're going to have six LEDs, six resistors, and then one of those sensors. And we're going to kind of use it to show like light up LEDs based on like how far away something is. So, and then we'll also need that resistor and a whole bunch of wires. It'll be fun. Um, so again, we're going to take um, one of the ground pins from the Pi, doesn't matter which one of them, and wire them up to the ground line on the breadboard. Um, we're going to take the 5 volt and also wire it to the breadboard. Um, and then for kind of ease, you can take a wire on both sides and hook it together, so now both of them would have the same like power system. Um, so wire up the LEDs kind of like we did before. We need resistors and then kind of, I think it's easiest to just make the LEDs go across the gap. Um, and what we're going to do is wire the trigger pin to a GPIO. So we're going to be able to control the trigger with that. Um, and then the echo pin, we need to wire back to the 1K resistor and the resistor back to GPIO. And that's because we can't have the five volts coming back in. So we send it through the resistor, it brings it down to about 3.3. And goes in so we don't fry our pie. Um, okay, so the echo. Um, so when we send out a signal with the trigger, it sends out a sound, it bounces, and then comes back to the other side, and the echo is what receives it. So the two little things on the front one's a speaker and one's a microphone basically. So the two pins are connected to both of those things. Um, all right, so we're going to import our library for the GPIO and the time again. Um, and then I think it's easy to just kind of, again, make variables. So our trigger pin is going to be 19, and the echo is 21, and kind of how I wired it up. And then my six LEDs go there. Um, and the U stands for ultrasonic. Um, so we're going to set up the board again, because we have to do that every time. And then for all of the LEDs, we're going to loop through and then just set it up to be an output and then turn it off. So that's kind of a quick and easy way to kind of shut off all your LEDs. Um, so we're going to make a function called read distance. Um, and then we can pass in like the pin numbers. We could also hardwire them in if you want. Um, I found sometimes when I run it, some warnings would come up on my console. So we can kind of turn those off with the set warnings equals false thing. Um, we're going to temporarily well, I don't think we even need the set mode there now that I think about it, but um, we can set the mode to the board again. So we're going to tell our trigger pin to be an output real quick. Um, and then um, set the echo to be an input, and then turn the trigger down. Um, and this, So we're going to kind of like flip it down real quick and then flip it back on. So it's going to be like 0.3 seconds. Um, and then flip it back on. What this basically does is it um, sends a quick little pulse out so that sound goes out. Um, we're going to wait just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction bit of a second um, and then set the trigger back to false. So it was off, we turned it on, we turned it back off, 
So we sent out that little pulse. And we have to wait a little bit longer just to make sure like the sound escapes and we don't hear it just as it's escaping. So that's kind of what the extra timing is for. Um, so we're going to say our signal off is zero. So basically we're going to just wait so many seconds or however long it takes. And then whenever signal on comes back, we can measure the time distance. So signal off is kind of now for zero. So while our echo is still off, we're going to just keep track of what time it is. So we're just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, once it hits true, that loop breaks out. Um, and then so we end up with our signal on and our signal off times. And the past time is subtracting the two. So this will be the actual time it took to hit an object and come back. Um, and then 17,000 is a magical number that basically converts the amount of time that happened into centimeters. So basically it's the speed of sound ratioed out to <laughs> the centimeters. Um, and so distance becomes that distance, basically, and we can return that. So it's kind of a little weird magical function, but hopefully that makes sense, kind of. I know it's without playing with it, it kind of, yeah. I can hear you, sorry. Um, this is going to be centimeters for this function. Um, if you change that number, it can be inches. And I don't remember what the number is off the top of my head. But, um, and whenever you buy sensors, they come with stat sheets. So you can also, it will tell you um, things like this. Um, so now that we know how to read the distance, we can make like another main program with it. So um, generally when we make electronics, we want them to kind of keep going. You know, if you think about an alarm clock, we don't want it to like go off and then like never come back on again. You know, like we wanted to kind of come back every single day and <laughs> go off. So most electronics, when we build them, we usually put them in infinite loops, which I think a lot of programming classes are like, infinite loops are bad, don't ever do them. But we almost always do them in electronics because um, you usually don't want your stuff to quit working. So, so we have a big infinite loop here. Um, so grab a distance. And then what we're going to do is, based on that distance, turn on the number of lights, how far away it is. So if we have six lights, we can kind of say for every like three centimeters, we can turn on one of our lights. So if it's like three centimeters, we're going to turn on the first light. If it's six centimeters, then two times three would be six, and we can turn on the second one, nine centimeters, you know, and so on. And if it's not that far away, we'll just turn it off. So we go through all six of them, find out the distance, divide by three, and then turn on those LEDs. Um, and so we end up with the, oh, go back, reloading, or, where's my, oh. I used to have a mouse. Oh, there it is. Oh, not sure why that didn't autoplay. But this is kind of a little sample to show off um, this. So, as it got closer, it would turn on and off the lights. So it's sending this little sound through one side, hits the little envelope thing I have, bounces back to the other one, um, and then can control that. So, hopefully, that demo made sense. So, Ultrasonic sensor, cool, not cool, yeah. Um, and they measure distance, but you can kind of use them as other things too. Like if you wanted to detect like if something went past, you can kind of like, well, from here to that wall is, you know, so many centimeters, but if it comes close, then the distance is going to shrink and then it goes long again, you know, something that's passed by it or um, different things like that. So you can kind of use them for a few different little things. Um, it depends on the sensor you buy. These, I think, are 40 centimeters. Um, and then because sound actually has to go out and come back, they don't work at zero centimeters. So I think it has to be at least like one away for it to bounce back. Um, there are some other types of sensors that can do like further distances, but or closer distances too. But this is not one of those. But it's these are kind of cheap, so. They're good for like simple little tinkering projects. All right, so ready for project three? Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, it 
Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just want like a barely, barely little pulse. So I think um, it can be that accurate. Okay. Um, the Pi has, you know, since it's kind of like a full computer, it can get pretty down to the microsecond, I think. Um, and if it's not like 100% precise, I think that's fine too, but um, it's just long enough to make like just a barely little chirp and then come back. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. And yeah, that would make sense because it would be double the distance there and back. So the distance really is only like half of that. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. So um, the third project is some push buttons and LCD screen. Um, and uh, these are also ways for like you to interact with um, your different projects. So I think you know not only does it you know send output, but this is a good way to get some input. So we'll do this too. Um, wait. A minute. Um, I think I feel like I'm missing slides. <laughs> I am missing slides. Where'd they go? Um. Hmm. They disappeared since the last time I gave this talk. Um, I can kind of just talk about them, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know where they are. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is also what happens if you get into enough dabbling and you end up with like a billion parts. It's like really good. Um, I'm actually kind of disappointed though. Um, so push button. <laughs> I wonder if I could find one online real quick. Um, this is kind of a bummer. I must not have saved my last presentation on this. Um, hey, there's a push button. I'm just gonna send that over. There we go. There's a push button. Um, so this one's kind of a pretty standard push button we have here. Um, so you kind of notice there's like these legs that come out on the side. There's two legs on each side. Um, I kind of look like since they're curved, I kind of imagine them like hugging the breadboard when they plug in. Um, but they are the distance across um, that. So basically, when you push it down, it connects the two sides together. So um, you can send in electricity in one side, and when you push it down, it will go out the other side. Um, and you can kind of also do the opposite, where um, if you have not electricity, if you have like low voltage and you push it down, it will carry the low voltage over. And it's because when you don't push it down, there's no voltage going through, like like nothing is. So it's a little confusing. You kind of have to wrap your head around. There's almost this third state of where we have like high voltage and low voltage and no voltage. <laughs> um, to wrap your head around that for a moment. But um, so one of the things you can do is use a resistor and we end up calling it a pull-up resistor. So if you wired one side up to ground and the other side up to like a GPIO pin and then put a resistor in the middle of that, what it ends up doing is, if it's not wired through, it will be high, but when you push it down, it will go low. Um, and it's a little kind of confusing to wrap your head around first, but um, using that idea, it becomes a little easier to program the GPIO pins. Um, so then you just wait for a GPIO to go low, and then you can do something. So you would use like GPIO.input of whatever pin, and you just kind of keep looping until you waited for a button to press and then you could do something with it. And what I was going to do with it was um, a logic guessing game, which I can try and track down the video for in a minute. But if I had 
three buttons and three LEDs. You can do like a Simon Says to remember, or I guess it's just Simon. A little like multicolored thing where you push, had to remember the pattern. Um, and the code for it is up on GitHub, but um, you'd push like a button to start and then it would like blink three lights randomly and you'd have to hit the buttons in the same process. Um, that's a fun little game. I taught this to a bunch of like high school girls. That was pretty cool. But um, one of the other things with it is when you push it down, because computers are so fast, it will detect it like cycling so many times, almost like you're pushing it like hundreds of times a second. So that gets a little confusing. So what you want to do is add in an extra little loop that says, okay, we put, we detected it pushing down. Now we're going to wait for it to not be pushed down. So while you're waiting for it to push down and then you wait for it to not push down, you know that's been a full button press. So um, using those two loops together, you can detect a press. Um, so um, building that inside of like a bigger loop, you can just look through all three of these buttons and say, has any of them been pressed? Once one has been pressed, because humans are slow compared to computers, you can really easily detect which one will get pressed. Um, and then you just kind of wait for that one to release. And then, you know, like, hey, the second button got pressed. Was that the second pattern? You know, was the pattern the second light that came on? And if so, you know, you can wait for the third press and so on. Um, or if not, uh, they lost. And an LCD screen? Um, I have this one and I can pass it around to you. Um, this one is, I think, 16 characters by two rows. Um, it's just kind of nice because for the most part, you just send it a signal and just tell it like what character to show up and it will just scroll text. Um, they're really easy to program and um, they just have four pins on the back and one is ground and VCC, which we kind of talked about earlier being ground and power. Um, and then one's labeled SDA and one's labeled SCL. And one's a, it's basically a clock cycle and a data pin. Um, I'm going to pull up that chart again real quick. Oops, that one. Okay. Um, so remember how I said some of these had special purposes? Um, and that's kind of what the faded gray text is on the side. Um, up here, we have two that are labeled I2C, which is a communication protocol that's not really important here. But um, one's labeled SDA and one's labeled SCL. Those two pins are what would connect to your SDA and your SCL on here. Um, so I'll go ahead um, Yeah, so um, with those, all you would just do is send um, like a string of text out to your SDA and SEL and it would work. And there's a library to communicate with those so you don't even have to mess with really kind of the wiring. You just say those are um, outputs and the framework kind of takes care of itself. You just say like print the screen on row one and it will just print it on there so it's kind of easy and for this game i would just say like you know press a button to start and then the buttons would or the lights would light up and then like press the buttons of the pattern and then would just say like you won or you lost um and i can try and dig up that video i'm kind of bummed that those slides disappeared um but for a terrible explanation does that kind of make sense <laughs> Um, yeah, and I was trying to get some of these to show up, but we had some AV difficulties, so I didn't end up, like, getting the live demos to actually plug in, because I kind of have to run commands on the Pi, and, um, we were just having a little bit of trouble, so sorry about that. Um, so that's kind of the basics of the three projects I wanted to show. Um, and I really wanted to show these because I think they're good introductions, but hopefully when you can start to see like the capabilities of different parts and different sensors, you can start to maybe elaborate like, oh, well, what if, you know, I connected a button on there that can detect when, you know, something happened or I don't know. And you can kind of think through different things to do with that. Um, um, I do, I think it's on my computer somewhere. <laughs> Um, so I was going to try and maybe go through this last part and then look for it real quick, but because um, I don't really want to make you wait for a few minutes while I look for it. But um, so hopefully with some of these like basic building blocks, you can not be nearly so scared about the hardware end and kind of think like, hey, you know, what if I made my 
coffee pot automatically fill with water because I pressed a button and it turned on the pump sensor that dumped some water in and then turned off the water once it got to a certain height because you could detect like a water level using a water sensor and then um, you know flip on a relay which would turn on the power to your coffee maker which would start brewing and you know um, which is actually a project I saw somebody do and it was really cool um, but so maybe some inspiration ideas um, different things I've heard I heard about somebody making a customized cookie machine so if you think about like you usually get a recipe for a dozen cookies and you're just like I don't know like what's the difference between brown sugar and white sugar or should I use an egg or not use an egg um, so I heard of somebody making a little machine that would dump in enough ingredients to make one kind of cookie and then would try out like well this cookie has more brown sugar and this cookie has more white sugar and this cookie has an egg and this one doesn't have an egg and would make like a dozen different cookies and then figure out like which kind of cookie tasted the best and test out different recipes which I thought was kind of cool. Um, you could build a little thing like sets on your monitor with the little LCD screen and show you like what your tweets or your emails came in and um, instead of different like a little notification thing. Um, you could take a remote control car and rip out its guts and then um, make a little sensors on it so it could just drive itself around which I always thought would be kind of fun to do. Um, robots, 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 robots. Um, we had all sorts of crazy little sensors on our robots we built in college. Um, which is really fun. Um, anything with home automation, I thought it would be fun to put some little motors on like the closing vents. So just say like if I'm not in a room, like a motion sensor didn't see me, it would just close off a vent and then not heat up the room or cool off the room. So it would just save some energy. Or you could do the same thing with like lights. If you walk into a room, your lights could come on for you. Uh, different things like that. So um, different fun ideas. One I knew from a friend, he put a Raspberry Pi on his garage door and so he could text it a particular message and then it, his garage door would open up for him. Um, you could probably also do the same thing by making like a little broadcaster thing in your car so as you drove up to your garage door it would detect it and kind of open it for you or if it detected your car wasn't in the garage anymore it could close the door for you. Different things like that. Um, so hopefully these can stir up some ideas. Um, one project I saw was a Bluetooth low energy cat door. <laughs> um, so it d had a Bluetooth chip on the cat's collar. And anytime the cat approached, um, you know, there was a beacon on the door and it was listening for the cat's chip. And whenever the cat got close, it would open the door. So this would prevent other animals or things from getting into the house. Um, so it only opened for this one particular cat. Um, and those are the directions on how to build that if you want. Um, Christmas like controller system. This guy <coughs> took a Raspberry Pi, controlled it up to a whole bunch of relays, and then um, let's see if this will work. Um, I just may need to copy the link on that. Um, <coughs> but um, yeah, basically it just played music and due to a timed little thing would turn on and off different Christmas lights. Um, okay. uh, I thought I made that clickable too. Let's see if that works. Nope, mouse is over there. Um, there we go. Well, we probably don't have sound, but um, you can kind of get the general idea of um, that. So relays are a little circuit thing. If you think about 120 volts from your electrical outlet, your Pi doesn't work very friendly with those because of that whole like three volt thing. So a relay basically it says if you send it a low power signal, it will turn on a high power signal. So you connect a positive and a negative from like a three volt thing and a positive and negative from a 120 volt thing. And you can kind of control it like that. So if you hear the clicking, like when you turn on your blinker in your car and you hear it click, 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 that's a little thing in your car clicking a relay. Your relay is going on and off, so that's where that noise comes from. You've been messing with relays. You didn't even know it. <laughs> um, so that's that. Um, let's go back to my little sidetrack. 
Um, come back, Sideshow. There we go. Thank you. Um, this was kind of a cool thing I saw in that there was some Oreo exhibit at South by Southwest. And they had a little touchscreen on the front. You could customize, like, what color you wanted an Oreo cookie to be. And then when you hit, like, create, you could see through another window. These, like, little machines would, like, drop a cookie onto this platter. And then, like, these frosting colors would come over and, like, 3D print this frosting on it. Your icing. Um, and then it would, like, drop another cookie on top. And then this cookie would slide over into a chute and they could eat the cookie. Um, which I thought was pretty cool. I don't know if this will... Of course you're not going to pull up. Why would you... Why would you want to be friendly? Um, let's see if I can copy that. Where's the minute? There we go. Um... There we go. Um, and that has a little commentary over it, but I can kind of jump forward to the part where... Uh, yeah. Um, so those things up there are, um, I think they're like pneumatic control systems, <laughs> um, which would control, like, when they turned on, it would start squeezing out the different colors of frosting or icing, whatever. Um, and then... That's actually Raspberry Pi parts down there. Um, you can see it just wires all over the place. Um, it kind of looks like an absolutely fun disaster to me. <laughs> um, probably a debugging mess if, when it doesn't work. But um, yeah, so and then that's a motor that's on a little drive shaft. So that would rotate all the icing things. And then that computer actually was the one that would show like what it was doing behind the scenes. Um, so it's like part Raspberry Pi, part like full computer. Um, so the people interacted with the computer and the computer told the Raspberry Pi kind of what to do and the Raspberry Pi would control all the hardware to build the thing. Um, yeah, come on, show me making the cookie. Um, let's see if I can like fast forward a bit. Oh, yeah, I think that's works. Yeah. Um, so that one built like a, <laughs> a swirly cookie. Um, okay. So now they've created it. You can kind of see the thing spin around. Um, and two of those little slots were just cookies. So it would like spin around, drop a cookie, and then spin around for the different colors. Um, so I don't know if I can show. This is really hard to control backwards. Um, it's a cool little machine. You can always like click on it and watch it later. But um, hmm? oh yeah, there it is. Uh, there you go. There's the cookie. <laughs> Drops down a little shoot, and there's your little cookie. So. It's kind of fun if you feel like making your own little Oreos. Um, yeah. So I've had a lot of people ask me, like, where can you buy parts? Um, uh, back where I used to live, there was a micro center. I think the closest one here is in Ohio, maybe Columbus. Um, so you probably don't want to do that. Um, there's different sites like Element 14 and Adafruit that you can buy Raspberry Pis from if you don't already have one. Um, power supplies are generally pretty cheap. They're 10 to 20 bucks. Um, you want a certain amperage from it. And so if you go back to that chart where I showed all the different parts, they show like a minimum amperage you would need to make sure you get the right power supply. Um, jumper wires, I buy them in bulk. I usually get like, I don't know, 50 at a time. And they're like three to seven bucks. Um, same for the LED sets. Um, like I said, I think calculating resistor values is an absolute mess, so you can buy them in little kits. Oh, there's the switches. <laughs> They're in the wrong thing. Um, but this is like one set that has LEDs and the resistors with them. Um, this one came with like six different colors too, so. Um, and I think this is like six bucks or something like that. So they're they're cheap, fun for tinkering around. Um, it's even fun for kids too, because this is such a low voltage system, they can't really do too much. 
simple electrocution, really. <laughs> um, absolute worst case scenarios, they might feel like a tiny little baby shock, but it won't really do anything. So, um, and then sensors, I usually recommend people just get a kit of like 15 different sensors, and then they can kind of fiddle around and experiment. Um, you can get like humidity sensors. Um, I've seen some people stick them in like their potted plants, so whenever the humidity gets low, they, you know, they either need to water them or they can turn on a thing to water them for them. Um, you can get like distance, you can get pressure ones, so they measure how much force is being put on them. There's some bending ones, so they, um, as you bend them, they send little signals. Um, so you can kind of think like whatever you might interact with an environment, there's probably some kind of sensor for that too. Um, yeah. Um, a few final thoughts. Development projects always take longer than we think, right? Like, um, my manager in the back can probably tell you this. Um, yeah, this is only going to take me a day, and it takes like three. Um, when you throw in hardware with it, it becomes even longer because you have to debug the hardware and the software together. So it ends up being kind of longer than you might think. Um, and hardware sometimes fails randomly. Um, like, for example, we had one robot on our robot team, and just one sensor was giving us like values all over the place, and we didn't know what was going on with it. Um, we just thought like the sensor was broke, and we found out later it was short shorting out somewhere. Um, so, if like you think your software should be working, and you're testing all the things, and it seems really reliable, it might be the hardware. So maybe try testing your sensor. Like pull it from the project and test it separately, um, things like that. Um, and I try to make myself open since I'm here at Code and Supply a lot. You could always like come by and ask me questions, or you can find me on Twitter or email or whatever too. Um, all right, so to kind of wrap this all up, um, a Raspberry Pi is it's a full PC, but the cool thing is you can use the GPIO pins to interact with other electronics too. Um, and you've seen a whole bunch of different sample projects, hopefully maybe spawned up a few ideas of maybe how you could use it in your own home or your own life, um, and maybe start to hack together one of your own projects. Um, thanks for coming, despite some of the sound problems in the beginning, if you're here early enough for that, and slide problems and all that good stuff. Um, but I would love to hear what you decide you want to do with this. I've heard some really cool projects from people over the past few years have been giving this talk. So if you have cool ideas, definitely um, share them with me. I'd love to hear them and maybe include them in a future version of this talk somewhere. And um, you're always welcome to find me on Twitter or email me, hello at sarahwithy.com, or just find me here. We're actually working on maybe having a little hardware lab over in the corner over there. So that might be a future thing. So. Um, thank you for coming.